Hey guys, thanks for joining us this Thursday for our live webinar. I'm Leah College, the Director of Real Wealth Realty, and I'm joined today by one of our go-to and long-term lending experts, Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. Hey, Chaley. Hi, Leah. Good to see you. Good to see you always, and so grateful to have you on to teach what I think is going to be a really powerful, uh, mind-blowing class for some. If, if anybody on the line or anybody watching this replay has never heard of the all-in-one first lien HELOC loan, uh, get prepared. We are going to blow your mind. This is an incredible tool um, and it fits so well into the education that we've been um, providing over the last couple of weeks. We've been talking a lot about how investors can look at the properties they already own, the investments they already have, or even their primary, and look at the equity that's in those homes and consider how that equity might be able to better serve them. Uh, to buy more properties in most cases. Um, and so if you've been following that education, chances are you've been looking at the properties you already own and calculating your return on equity. And I'm hoping you're itching to do something. And we've talked about several different options that you have to, to tap into that equity and, and deploy it um, to better use. And we've asked Chaley. Uh, Chaley is the queen of the all-in-one loan, uh, in my opinion. She does a great job of teaching this loan product. It is a little complicated, so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to keep your brain engaged today. Um, but we've asked her to come on to talk about this really powerful loan product that can be used on a primary home, it can be used on a secondary home, and it can be used on an investment property. Um, so without further ado, we're going to jump right in today. Um, I'll cover a couple housekeeping items and then we will jump right in. Okay, so if you are joining us live, one of the best parts about joining a live webinar is that you can interact with us. Chaley and I are going to have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. Um, I'll monitor questions as they come in. So if we're on a relevant topic and we want Chaley to expand a little bit on something, shoot those questions over. Um, I, I am watching them. Uh, we'd love to interact with you guys. So this is our standard disclaimer. The strategy we're gonna talk about today, while it is an awesome one, it might not be suitable for your specific situation. So keep that in mind. Um, this has to make sense for you. You should be consulting your own accountant, tax advisor, and or attorney to discuss your specific situation. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Real estate purchases are subject to investment risks, um, including the loss of all that you've invested. So uh, while we do think this is a powerful loan product, Chaley is an excellent team to execute for you and get you into it. Um, please know that the possibility of errors uh, is, is always there. Um, so as we always say, uh, you are in the driver's seat of your due diligence for all your investments and, and how you get into those investments. Okay. So Chaley, let's jump right in. If you want to um, pull up the, the slides from, from your end, um, and then maybe start off by giving us a little bit of a, an introduction to who is Chaley Ridge? How did she get into this specialized niche of, of lending? Um, and tell us about your, your company. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Leah. Uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate what Real Wealth does. Um, similarly, I've, uh, Kathy, as you know, Kathy and I go back many, many, many years, 20 plus, I think, at this point. And what I really love about Real Wealth, just briefly, is that you guys focus so much on education, and that is so resonant in what we do here at Ridge. We're all about education first. I think that especially from the lending side of real estate investing, you guys, um, it's it's lacking, really lacking out there. And whatever you can get online is either not relevant to what you're asking, what you need, your goals, your qualifications, it's outdated, or it's just bad, wrong information. Without the leverage, our rate of return is diminished. So I just think it's so important to have somebody or uh, a, an advocate in lending that can provide a look under the hood, as I like to say. So really love that Real Wealth does all the education. That's that's really close to my heart um, and what we do here. So uh, as a value add, you're gonna hear me talk about education and that's what we're here for today anyway. Yeah. So on my screen, Leah, I see, show my screen. Am I gonna do that, right? Yep. Okay. And I'll add I this see. little anecdote. I mean, Chaley, I connected with you first when I was a, a member of Real Wealth, a brand new member of Real Wealth. Uh, my husband and I were living in Europe and kind of at the at the very beginning of like wanting to really scale and do it really effectively and not missed up all along the way. And and we were introduced uh, to you personally. And I did really appreciate that initial call that we had where you kind of helped us jumpstart and really think about you know what we were trying to build long term not just any any lender can help you get the next loan right sure. like uh to a certain point 
Um, but you really sat down to help us think like big picture, long-term. How do we get all 10 of your golden tickets, as you call them, uh, maxed out before we start looking at these alternative loan products? Yeah, thanks, Leah. That that means a lot to me um, because it's exactly what I have built after 25 years of being in this space. Um, we, we've tr really tried to be holistic and not transactional. And as a result, just tapping into what you said, having all the education and that one-on-one -on -one with our clients is hugely important and building that trust and that relationship for not one transaction, but many, many transactions. Because think about this, you guys, um, as your qualifications change over time, we're investors. We're not just buying or refinancing our primary residence, which is kind of a one and done. I mean, certainly we upgrade or downgrade and refinance occasionally, but as investors, we're buying and refinancing and 1031 exchanging, et cetera. So our debt to income ratio and, and our assets and our credit, all of those things are gonna be a fluid uh, moving target sort of understanding how from an underwriting perspective those things can change and then how to optimize them how do you read a schedule e from an underwriter's perspective that kind of stuff so um it's it's one of the things i'm proudest of uh in terms of that value add from ridge and then very quickly you guys i'm not going to bore you with my resume you, we can have other conversations i've been doing this 25 years uh, we have a very diverse menu of loan programs um the fanny freddies bridge loans um the all-in-one that we're going to talk a lot about, well, all about today. We've got commercial for residential, commercial for commercial, DSCR loans. It's it's quite diverse, as I said. So very rarely do we have a situation where an investor comes to us that we cannot provide uh, financing for whatever their needs are. So that would be um, value add number two, education, diversity of loan product, uh, my experience in the business. But I think also what I just want to share with you guys, because I will often give a little bit of my experience and advice. I'm a real estate investor. I've held many, many properties all over the United States. So I, I find that having both lenses and being able to provide some of that feedback, well, I hope it adds some credibility, like I say, but um, more than that, I, I, I want to impart to you my wins and losses. I've got plenty of both. Um, so you can make more informed decisions. So enough about that. Let me just, I'm just gonna get right into this. And before we jumped on here, everybody, uh, we had a quick conversation, Lee and I, and there is an interactive simulator. Um, so this is the PowerPoint, the, the slide deck here. Um, I might go through just a little bit of this and just kind of give some verbal explanation. For those of you that are not familiar with this concept whatsoever, I, I may slide through this quickly and then get to this interactive simulator where I'm gonna be sharing screen and show you what this looks like. Because as Leah had mentioned, um, in terms of understanding conceptually what this is, the learning curve is tough. I, I wanna just quickly share with you, I know what I'm talking about. I've been doing this for a very, very long time. I know finance very well. Uh, I think after 25 years, if I didn't, I'd have some bigger problems. But my point is, when this was first introduced to me, uh, many, many years ago, I had to look at this dang loan for two weeks every day before I was able to connect the dots. So what I, when I talk about this on a day-to-day -day basis, I probably have 100 of these conversations a day, um, I want to make sure to set the expectation that this is probably not the first time, again, if you're new to this concept, the first time you're going to have to hear it. You're probably going to have to hear it several times, but that simulator that I think I'm going to jump to in a minute, uh, I think will be really useful at, at connecting some of those dots and, and getting you along in, in understanding. So what is the all-in-one? Okay, guys, if you've ever heard of the concept velocity banking or infinity banking, if those terms are familiar to you, or maybe you know what whole life insurance uh, policies do, this is similar, okay? It is a first lien HELOC. So when you say first lien, that means when you guys think about HELOCs, a lot of people will just um, default to what is a second lien HELOC, right? You have your first, uh, first lien 30-year fixed mortgage, and then you think HELOC is probably that second lien mortgage. That's not what this is. This is a first lien HELOC. So whatever you have, if it's not free and clear, if the property is not free and clear, if you have a mortgage on it, this loan will replace what's there. Now, for those of you that are thinking, well, I've got a 2% interest rate that I got during the pandemic, I want you to just take a pause and please, for this conversation at least, forget what you think you know about interest rate. The psychology of the actual number and the rate, I want you to remove that from your brain if you can for a moment Okay, because for the right individual, it won't matter. So the simulator, I'll get to it in a second, um, will, the math won't lie. Okay, when you pun punch in your information, and we'll get you a link to that, I'm sure, uh, at some point, so you can do it for yourself. When you plug in your information, okay, it's going to be comparing this first lien HELOC all-in-one to what you have now. 
the results page will be very clear if you're a good candidate for this or not. And in comparing, I do the simulator, I'll get 2% interest rates. And for the right individual, this HELOC that is fully indexed at a rate of 8.08 .08 right now, come back to that later, crushes it, absolutely crushes it. So again, please just remove what you think you know about interest rate just for a moment. And trust me, as we get through this, um, it, it really doesn't matter when you understand conceptually what the all-in-one does. Okay. So on this slide, um, what it's communicating to us is that the all-in-one is, it's called the all-in-one because it incorporates two functions. You have the mortgage in the form of an open-ended HELOC, and it attaches itself to your personal banking, your checking and savings, okay? That's why it's called the all-in-one. And just in case, okay, I wanna give this definition, um, a fixed rate mortgage, the one that we are kind of preconditioned in the US to understand is where you have amortization, okay? That is where you are monthly making payments that there is interest and principal based on the initial loan that you took out and the interest rate that you secured over the term, whether that, let's just use 30, 30 year fixed because that's the most common, so over 360 months, okay? Monthly you're paying, Part of your payment is gonna go portion to principal and part of it's gonna to go to interest. Whereas the HELOC is open-ended. This is interest only, okay, on the all-in-one. The other thing too to remember, most of you probably are familiar with this. When you think about a 30-year fixed mortgage, um, the first, let's say 10 years of that mortgage, how much of your payment do you guys, if anyone's looked at an amortization table, you know this, but how much of that principal and interest payment that you're making every month, how much is going to the principal in the first 10-ish years? Very little. This much? Yeah, th this much. <laughs> very, very little. And the reason for that is because the powers that be, we have the, the benefit of having a long amortization that keeps our payments, what, lower, right? Our, our payments are going to be much lower as a result of having a full 30 years amortization. Mm -hmm. But because they want their the lending Money. institutions, right? <laughs> they want their interest. You're gonna front load that with almost entirely interest. You're not gonna start paying your principal until the back end of the loan. And the other reason that that might be important, and I don't wanna get off too far on a tangent here, but statistically speaking, and you guys do your own research and look this up, the average shelf life for a 30 year fixed mortgage, and this kind of plays into your 2% interest rates that everybody has secured over the pandemic, even with those low, low interest rates, I can guarantee you that the percentage of people that will start with a 30-year fixed mortgage, especially on a rental property, um, and then make 360 payments later to pay that thing off is a fraction, fraction of percent. I don't care what interest rate you started with. It's highly, highly unlikely. And maybe you're an exception to the rule, okay? But highly unlikely you're gonna keep that mortgage for, for a full 30 years. Whether you refinance it to pull cash out and harvest equity, you sell it, whatever, whatever, it's highly unlikely, okay. Um, this isn't super important. Uh, just briefly, the U.S. is kind of behind the, the times a little bit. And when it comes to this concept, it's been um, mainstream in much of the rest of the world. The U.S. is, uh, it, it's, a lot of people don't know about this. And I have some conspiracy theories about it. I think it has to do with the GSEs, government sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Trillions of dollars are made in interest within that socialist program, which by the way, don't make any mistake, those those loan products are socialist, FDR, never mind, I'll move on. My point is, is that most of the rest of the world has been utilizing this concept effectively for many, many years. Uh, the reason that it's not more mainstream here is uh, you can interpret how you want there. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try and paint a picture, you guys, and, and uh, outline exactly what this is and how it's gonna work. So this is interest saved. Okay, when you think about interest that you would earn, right, that's pretty obvious. This is interest saved. And there are compounding effects, two specifically, two compounding effects, effects at work here that are going to be saving you interest by utilizing this principle and this concept. Okay, so because we've got this open-ended revolving line of credit that is your line of credit for 30 years, by the way, and it couples with your checking and savings account, when you combine those two things, it is such a powerful tool because on any HELOC, okay, any HELOC, the interest accrual is based on the daily balance and that month's fully indexed rate, okay? So if you know that you've got your, your depository accounts attached to this line of credit and you're utilizing it just as you would what, with what you're doing now, dollar for dollar, all your depository income, is going to go into this checking and savings account 
where the HELOC lives. So dollar for dollar, that balance in the HELOC is going to be driven down. And the longer you leave that income in against the balance, the less interest you're going to pay. Okay, so you've got the daily interest savings. There's compound effect number one. And then you've got the monthly residual, AKA monthly leftover, monthly savings, that's gonna sit in there and ride while you're not utilizing it. Compounding effect number two, because it's gonna continue to drive that balance down. So let me, let me give you uh, that verbal uh, example that I think is helpful for that mental picture. So I want you to imagine that you have an outstanding balance on your line of credit, on your HELOC of $100,000, just for round numbers, okay? And we're also gonna say that you make or bring in in all depository access, $10,000 a month, okay? From all sources, and I mean all sources. So that would be gross rents, because that's the other thing about this product that's so great for investors is, is that most of us have access to two grand, five grand, 20 grand, 30 grand a month of gross rents that before we make mortgage payments or whatever other expenses might be applicable, we have access to those gross rents. So gross rents and the net of everything else in the deposit section. So net, W-2, um, uh, commissions, bonus, child support, alimony, social security, dividends, interest, right? As those apply to you, net of all of that and gross of the, the rents, okay? In this example, we're gonna say that's $10,000 a month. And just to keep it simple, we're gonna say that you make that 10,000, you get that full number on the first of the month. Obviously that's not applicable to most people. It's, it's, got, it's received throughout the month, but we're gonna say you get it on the first of the month, just to keep it easy. So you have $100,000 in this line of credit, that's your balance. You make $10,000 a month, you get it on day one of month one, you drop it into your account. What happens to my balance? My $100,000 balance is now immediately $90,000. You're going to leave that hundred or that ten thousand dollars in the account for 29 days out of a 30-day billing cycle. You're not going to touch it. Well, what about all of my living expenses? What about all my bills? What about all this? You're going to use a credit card or credit cards of your choice to pay for everything. Down to a stick of gum is going to go on that credit card. Now on day 30, because you heard me say 29 days, right? On day 30, before the credit card accrues any interest. You're gonna go online to where your 10 grand has been sitting. And by the way, this checking account is an FDIC insured bank that will house this. Completely automated. Everything that you guys have with your Wells or Chase or B of A right now, exactly what you're gonna have here. So you're gonna go online to where your 10 grand's been sitting, excuse me, and you're gonna pay off all of the bills that have um, amassed on that credit card. We're gonna call it $9,000. $9,000 has been put on the credit card and on day 30, you're gonna go online to where your 10 grand has been sitting and you're gonna pay that credit card off, okay? So what's left over? $1,000, right? A thousand bucks is left in there. While it's sitting idle, right? What is it doing in your checking and savings at B of A right now? Nothing, right? You're earning what? Nothing, a, a percent, 2% a year, whatever it is, it's virtually nothing. So instead of it being there earning and doing nothing, we're gonna leave it in here, 24 seven access, to drive that balance down and reduce the amount of interest that can accrue over time. So now I want you to think and fast forward to day one of month two. So we're starting the month, instead of $100,000, what are we starting with? 99,000 is our balance because we still had $1,000 left over from the prior month. That's compounding effect of interest saved number two. So month one, month two, day one, our outstanding principal balance is 99,000. I get my $10,000, I drop it in there. And now what is my outstanding balance for the 29 days of month two? 89,000, right? So I'll stop there, I'll pause there because you guys can probably see where that's going. But those are the two compounding effects of interest savings. You will never pay more interest than what the principal balance is for that month or that day and what the fully indexed rate is for that month. So for those individuals, just to kind of take this um, to the next level, uh, I already went over that. I don't really need to do that. Um, take this to the next level. For those that have idle cash, think about this too. So go back to my example. I'm going ahead, you guys, hold on. I'll come back to this in a second. So those that have, let's say you've got 50 grand in just cash kind of sitting around that isn't being deployed, not being used for anything at this point in time. And go back to my original, um, my original example. 100 grand is the balance, and you've got $10,000 a month of income. Well, this 50,000 bucks is sitting over here doing nothing. You're going to drop it in, right, from this account, this checking savings, and you're going to drop it into this checking and savings, driving that balance down even further. 
and saving all, all that interest. I have clients, check this out. I have clients that have enough disposable at any point in time for most of the month, let's call it 29 days of the month, where they pay almost zero interest on the mortgage. And why is that? Because you will never pay interest on equity that is not being utilized at that point in time. So the more you can drop in there, the longer you can leave it in there within that 30 day billing cycle, the less interest that you're going to accrue. Okay. And that's how this works in the power of having access to this line of credit. You guys have created a scenario where you've become your own bank. Okay. Um, all right. Let me check out these slides and see how much of this let's, okay. Let's go over some of the, um, the logistics. So this is a 30 year line of credit. I think I mentioned that before. Uh, if you know terms on a HELOC, more often than not, if you're familiar with that, you probably have a three year draw. Maybe you have up to a 10 year draw interest only, and then it shuts off after a certain point and it becomes a principal and interest, right? You don't have access to it anymore and it's not interest only. You got to start repaying that debt, right? Well, this is very, very unique. It's one of my favorite features of this loan. It is a 30 year line of credit. What happens is, is that in the month one of year 11, the limit, the, the high credit limit will start to reduce very slowly. So think about this, first 10 years, totally unchanged, okay? And then the remaining 20 years of this 30 year line of credit. So if you think about 20 years and how many months are in 20 in, in, a, in a year, 12 times 20 is 240 months, right? So in the first month of year 11, the limit is gonna go down by one 240th percent. That 240 is representative of, to the number of months that are left in that remaining 20 years or that trailing 20 years, okay? Now, because you can never owe more than the limit, your balance can never exceed the limit, that's how repayment works, all right? And, and we'll take questions on this. Um, for qualifying purposes, I may come back to that. We'll talk about that later. Loan amount, initial draw. I don't think you need that. Why don't I jump, you guys? I'm going to, let me talk about the rate and then I'll jump to the, the simulator. Um, so this is true for any adjustable rate mortgage, whether it be a five-year arm or a HELOC, a second lien, a first lien, it doesn't matter. Any adjustable rate mortgage where the interest rate is subject to change is comprised of two numbers. There's an index and a margin. The index is variable. That is the number that can change. And there are dozens of indices out there. You guys are probably on seeing all the headlines about the Fed fund rate. That is an index. That happens to be the daily intra-trading rate between banks. That's what the Fed fund rate is. Um, you've probably heard of prime. That's an index. Uh, the index that this loan is tied to is the one year CMT. That stands for, or that's the US Treasury. Okay, one year CMT, that's the index. It is currently posting, well, I have, I have information that says as of October 1st, it's gonna post at 4.08. September 1st, it, it posted at 4.38. So you can see it's on the run uh, like the rest of the indices and, and interest rates that I'm sure you guys will have questions about later. So as of October 1st, the one year CMT will post at 4.08. That's the index, that one can move. And then the margin is the second number, index and margin. The margin is fixed. It can never change. It will never change. If you have this loan for a full 30 years, that margin is fixed. It will not move. So when you add those two numbers together, index and margin, you get your fully indexed rate. This rate can adjust up to once, one time per month. In knowing that, I know a lot of people, oh, it, it can change once a month. I will get back to some of the security of that. Okay, there's a floor rate and a life cap that we'll get into in a second. But just in terms of how you're gonna calculate interest, remember it's based on the fully indexed rate and the daily, not monthly, the daily principal balance, okay? And whatever that interest accrual is on that day, that's gonna, that's gonna take a snapshot for 20 more, 29 more days of that month and then it'll add up together how the interest accrued for that month based on those factors, okay? Um, Let's go, I'm gonna go to the all-in-one, I think. Let's just do the simulator, you guys. We'll get back to, let me see if there's anything else in here that I think would be super useful. The slide yeah, that yeah. I love was, you have one in there that talks about who is who is the ideal person for this, because that was kind of when my light bulb came on. Yeah, who, okay. who is this for? The easy answer is, is that, I guess I can put this back in slideshow so it looks a little more professional. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so, 
I would say that on average, okay, and I really think this is a one-on-one -on -one conversation, so please feel free to reach out, everybody, but if you've got about 10% in residual every month with whatever you've got coming in, if there's 10% left over, more often than not, the all-in-one will be the right fit for you. That's the just the general overview rule of thumb. Yep. And then and I, I felt like there was a certain type of property that was almost ideal for this too. I felt like I felt like it to justify it, it and to really be powerful, it needed to be kind of an expensive property too. Would you agree with that? I agree with that. And here's why. Generally speaking, okay, there's like I said before, there's exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, I think the all-in-one works best for the property that's going to have the highest value. And generally the owner occupied, because the owner occupied in terms of the guidelines and allowances lets you leverage at a higher percentage than a, an investment property. So for those two reasons, that's gonna give you the highest line limit. And I think that for all intents and purposes, I think you want the largest line limit that you can have for the reason I described a minute ago, you've turned yourself into your own bank. So right. I'll give you an example. Let's say that your, your investment property is, I can't do mental math, so let me get my calculator ready. Let's say the investment property is valued at 250. Well, the loan to value on a cash out refi we can do purchase, rate and term refi, cash out refi. But on a cash out refi, if the value of the property on your rental is 250, 70% max loan to value, that would give you a line limit of 175,000. Let's mm -hmm. say your primary residence has a value of 750, okay? 750,000. Typically, our homes that we live in are going to be higher value. Times 80% loan to value, you've got a $600,000 line of credit. So, right. Exceptions yeah. to the rule, but generally that's what I would say. Um, the best property is usually going to be the primary, mm -hmm. 80% of the time. So you're not necessary. You're not doing an all-in-one loan on one of the investment properties. More than likely that you bought from a real wealth team a couple of years ago for you know 150. That's now worth 250. That that's probably not the one that you're going to do the HELOC on. It's probably if you have a vacation property. Um, you know, on the beach somewhere that's high value, or like Chaley mentioned, your primary is high value, or maybe you timed the acquisition of a quadplex just perfectly and it's worth a million, a million and a half now. That's the property that I think you're going to want to be looking at for this loan product. For optimization, I agree. To maximize yep. the, the, the use the of it. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you wouldn't, and and you wouldn't yeah. necessarily do this loan, Chaley, right? Unless you're planning to use the equity, right? Like you would, would you go through all the trouble of it if you weren't planning on redeploying the equity into other purchases? There's so many, there's so many value adds about the all-in-one. I mean, there's so many reasons that it just kicks a, a closed-ended amortized mortgages, but, um, yeah. but ideally, yeah, especially for those on this call, investors, it's such a, a, a huge life-changing tool for so many people but even if you weren't going to redeploy i think yes you you're going to want to utilize that that equity but now it's available to you guys for <clears throat> without having to re-pre-qualify every couple of years to pull cash out you're not paying closing costs again you're not going through the loan process again you now have access to this line of credit so to do that and to reinvest i think is the obvious use of it but check this out. Here's another just kind of um, uh, subset or, or byproduct of why this is so great. And this is where people really get confused, and myself included when I, when I was first looking at this. Um, bear, stay with me. There's no payment due. There's no payment due on the all-in-one. The only time an actual deposit is mandated is when your balance, what you owe, is about to exceed your limit. So imagine this, let's say that you have a limit of a half a million. You've got a line limit of a half a million dollars and you owe a hundred grand. That's the balance. You have a $400,000 spread there to do what you want, when you want, how you want. God forbid something happens and you lose access to any sort of in, incoming income. You've you got nothing. You don't have to make a deposit into this account. It's your account. It, can, it will obviously continue to accrue interest but if you needed to, if you needed to pull cash to pay for college tuition or whatever it may be, that's your equity to use for whatever you want. Um, and let's say that you just need it for living expenses for a couple of months because of whatever circumstances happen. You can certainly pull from it to live off of for whatever amount of time that you needed to. Again, the balance is going to go up because interest accrues. But so what? While well, you're getting back on your feet, you do not have to make a deposit 
in that loan until mandated until the balance is about to exceed. So there's a safety net there, a really impactful safety net um, as, like I said, a, a byproduct of the value of this loan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I hope everyone's still with us. Uh, give give us some affirmation if you're still following this before <sighs> before Celia jumps into the calculator. The calculator honestly was what, when, when my husband and I sat down and really looked at this, was what, when you look the numbers in the face, you're like, okay, I can't deny. Yes, it's a higher interest rate and that's what everyone gets hung up on to Chaley's earlier point. Um, but when you see... <laughs> how much you save over the, the term of the loan and the fact that you've been able to use the equity to purchase more assets all along. I mean, it's, it's yeah. Huge. Incredible. Okay. Watch this, you guys. So this is the simulator. Um, again, I'm sure that, that um, Leah and team are going to give you access to the link here. You can go to Ridge Lending's site as well. It'll be right in there. So we're going to do a new simulation. I'm starting it from the beginning. So if you want to follow along, feel free. Um, you can see the, all on, yeah, you can see the website there if you want to do it with me. So we are going to go and do a rate and term refinance. We're going to compare. So what I, I think is kind of powerful is I just want to show you a simulation that I've done recently on a primary residence, and I'm going to compare it to your 2.5% interest rate, okay? So primary, and then when you do the comparison type, we are going to compare the all-in-one to an existing loan, okay? This is what the person has on their mortgage right now. Property value is a million bucks, and they owe 500000 okay? We're not even talking about yet the availability of equity that they would be tapping into and utilizing for more returns, more investments. This is just taking what you have right now and showing you how it would match up to the all-in-one if, if these were your particular numbers. So it's a 30-year fix we're going to compare to. Let's use two and a half and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, you guys, the math won't lie. Okay, if you put the if you input accurately, and I'll show you what you're going to be looking for in a second it'll be very clear on the results tab whether or not you're the right candidate for this. I would suggest that we do it together to make sure, but that's another conversation. Okay, uh, we're in 2024. Let's say that this is 36 months old. Okay, you got this loan three years ago. These are the terms that it's on. So what the simulator has done is it has taken this $500,000 at 2.5% over 30 years, and it's three years old. This would be the principal and interest payment on that mortgage today. Okay, principal and interest only. So when you do this and you look at this, if this is within a few bucks of what your real principal and interest is, it's fine. If it's significantly different, you've done something wrong. Okay, it's probably here in the age of the loan in months, but otherwise that's right on the money. Um, if you have a second lien and or let's say that you want to compare the all in one, you don't want it. You just got this psychological holdup on keeping your two and a half percent or whatever it is. You just can't get rid of it. Fine then what I want you to do is I want you to take a minute and see what would it look like if I added, instead of doing this, I'm gonna add a second lien. I'm gonna pull out a $200,000 HELOC, second lien HELOC. Make sure you put that in here. So you would go, in this case, I'm gonna remove this in a minute, but you would say, let's say you're gonna pull out 200,000 bucks. You're gonna compare it to a 10-year HELOC. That's the most common. Let's say interest rate is at prime. Okay, 8% right now, and you're, you're just going to get it it's in month one. You're going to do it at the same time. That would be your interest-only payment. So if you wanted to compare and keep your first lien and get a new second lien HELOC, go ahead and plug in those numbers, okay? I'm leaving that zero. Let me make sure it's saved my changes. Good. Next. Now, this is where a lot of people get hung up, and I find that they put the, they, they're not understanding what the simulator is asking for. They're interpreting it wrong. So they put in the wrong values, and of course the results aren't gonna be valid then. So what I have people do here is you've got repeating deposits, and you can continue to add them in there, and then you've got one-time deposits. I'm gonna leave this blank. But when I was talking a second ago, if you've got idle cash, five grand, 20 grand, 100 grand, whatever it is that's just kind of hanging out for most of the month or, or what have you, you would throw it in here, and you would just define that by when it would be going in. If it's immediate, you'd put month two. It says month two because it needs a month after you close to transfer servicing rights, et cetera. Or let's say that you know that you get $10,000 refund on your tax return every single year. You can simulate this to put 10 grand in there. And then what would that be? Four, five, six, seven months, right? You can um, uh, characterize it that way. So for the repeating deposits, if you can, and in our case, in my example, I'm gonna do it this way, I'm gonna lump everything together. The gross rents, remember I said gross rents, now, if you self-manage, that's totally gross rents. If you have a property manager, 
make sure that they get their piece first because that always happens, right? Mm -hmm. So you want the gross rents before anything goes back out the door. We have access as investors to utilize usually a substantial amount of money during the month to just let it sit idle here. So remember, you're replacing whatever checking and savings that you have now for this fully automated checking savings here. So gross rents and then net after taxes from every other source. So this individual's got 20 grand coming in the door, okay? And it's monthly. Now you can, you can see by the frequency, you guys can get real specific. You can add the repeating deposits if you want to. I'm lumping it in one. This is the more conservative way actually to look at it. If you did this as it really lived in reality, you'd do it differently with frequency and, and the different amounts. So I'm just doing the one. We're not doing a one-time deposit now. This is the final page before we get to the results, okay? The, the simulator will default to 1.5% of the value that we put in here. That's what that number is, okay? So I'm just going to leave it. And then the final thing that you have to come up with is how much is left over? You got $20,000 going in here. How much do you have in that monthly savings every month on average, okay? I'm going to throw in 20%, okay? So this individual's got four grand left over after the 20,000 goes in there. Okay, now the simulator assumes the following. This is important. So if you guys are writing down or, or trans, uh, uh, transcribing all this, I want you to stop and, and listen to me. The simulator assumes that in addition to this 20 grand sitting in there for 29 days of that 30 day billing cycle, that this number, what you're currently sending out to Rocket Mortgage or Penny Mac or whatever it is, this number and this number, so that would be 61, 23 and 74 cents, are being left in the account. The simulator assumes that if you were to replace your existing mortgage with the all-in-one, that this that is currently going back out, you're not gonna be utilizing it for some other living expense, right? It's not going back out the door, it's gonna live in here now, along with this. So those two numbers are gonna be sitting idle in this account on average month after month. 24 seven access, you guys. What would happen, let me ask you a question. What would happen if you sent in your $2,000 a month mortgage payment that you send to, to, let's just keep using Rocket, whatever, and your $4,000 left over, you decided to, to apply it every month with your 30-year fixed mortgage? <laughs> it's gone. Why would you never do that, right? You'd never do that because you mm -hmm. couldn't get it back. It's no longer liquid. Here mm -hmm. it's liquid. Okay. So the other thing now, remember, I'm just comparing, what time do we have? I'm just comparing um, what you have now. We're not even looking at this thing yet with for the from the eyes of, access to the equity and what it can do for you in, in making more uh, acquisitions and returns, et cetera. But mm -hmm. that's where this would come in. If we have time, I'll come back to this link because as you saw before that one-time deposit that we want to put in there, we can also account for one-time future expenses. So if there's equity in the account, I can say, I'm going to take out $25,000 in month 12. And in which case I'm going to buy another investment property. Remember, if you're going to do that here, what would that if I do this, what is it going to mean to me monthly? I'm going to have another return, right? If I go buy, if I right. take $25,000 and I go buy it and put it down on an investment property, I'm going to have gross rents of, of a grand, whatever. Mm -hmm. So if you do it here, make sure you put it back in on the deposits page. Oops. I don't know why it does that. 20%. Okay. The unveiling. All right. I'm going to change one thing and then we'll come back and I'll show you the, the results. So the simulator, let me tell you how I got here, sorry. So on the results page, rates and assumptions tab, the simulator defaults the rate trend to remain at the initial fully indexed rate, which currently is the 8.380. This will say 8.08 .08 in about four days, okay? It's still September, so it won't update until October. But this assumes the rate trend is it stays at the initial fully indexed rate. It assumes that interest rates don't change and they don't move. That is not an accurate way to look at this. So while I, I am always very conservative on this thing, my advice would be is to look at the historical average rate. So remember I talked about the one-year CMT, the index that this is tied to before? The simulator has 25 years, okay? 300 months of data collected on the one-year CMT that has said where that, that has posted every single month. So the historical average is really the way that you wanna look at this. Okay. All right, I can come back and answer questions on that later if you guys want to. Okay, so wow. 500,000, 500,000. We've got this 500,000, if we were to have lived by the, the numbers that we put in here, will be paid off in 9.2 years, 
versus the 27 because remember we've got we've had we've got three years on this loan as it is in this particular case with this person's scenario you're only saving about 16,000 in interest so it's not a huge huge number but let's let's play with this a little bit and see maybe somebody's got 50 grand that they would sit idle in here while it's not being utilized let's see how it changes the numbers okay now we're saving interest we're paying off in 8.1 years so you can see how that moves the needle anyway why don't I, Leah, is this a good time maybe to take a pause and see if people have questions since we're we're 15 minutes left to the hour? I know, I think we're okay. Everyone was affirming that they're that they're with us. There are a few questions, okay. but um but this is this is really awesome to see. So okay. we grip tight to our two and a half percent interest rate. Um, you know, but seeing that we could because it's saying that the, the payoff is in eight years as well. So not only are you saving on interest, but you are you have a free and clear home in eight years versus 27 years, right? Right, yeah, with a line of credit that you can continue to grab at and, and utilize at your at your leisure. So real quick, I wanna show you guys, when you're in here, if you wanna save your work and go back to it later, you just simply go here, there's a key code, okay, that you can use, and then when you go to the get started, it'll ask you to put it in here, okay. Um, let's do one more, let's say it's on a new purchase, okay? at current interest rates. Now that was the two and a half percent interest rate. Watch this. Let's do one more. We're gonna go purchase. I'm gonna go primary. We're gonna to compare to a new traditional, right? Before we compare to the existing, I'm gonna use some of the similar numbers. And let's say that the purchase price, I'm just gonna keep using the same stuff, is a million. And we're gonna put 20% down. You can actually go 10% down on this, but we'll just, we'll just use that. Uh, we're gonna compare it to a 30 year fixed, Let's be real generous with a 30-year fixed um, owner-occupied purchase right now at this level. Let's say that you can get 5%. I don't think that you can, but let's just say, I'm just using that as a number, okay? And everything else that we had in here, I'm gonna do the same. So we've got 20,000 coming in. This is monthly, leave that the same, and we've got 20% left over. Let's say 10%, okay? So the simulator, is going to assume, remember guys, that this number, this is the principal and interest payment using 5%, 800,000 on 30 years. It's gonna assume that this number and this number is what's left over every month that just rides in the account. You can access it whenever you want without condition. Hold on a second. Go here. So looking at it side by side at a 5% interest rate, so here, let me just real quickly. So the left side of all these different tabs, if you guys come in and play and you see a left side and a right side, the left side is always gonna be the all-in-one. The right side is our 30-year comparison. So there's our starting 800,000, same, same. Total interest accrual based on these values, these numbers. And remember, I only have 10% savings in here, okay? I'm just, just for fun, I just wanna make it look pretty cool. Let's go 20%, okay. So you're gonna pay off $800,000 in about 11.7 years. The total interest accrual based on our values is about 346,000 versus 746,000, okay? 140 months versus 360 months. Then these final numbers here, the two numbers above, the, the principal and the interest equals the total expenses. Come on, mouse. Total expenses here, total expenses here. The difference between those two numbers would be $399,000 in saved interest between these two scenarios. Yeah. which is, is pretty cool. Um, let me show you one more screen. Well, I think that'll confuse everybody. Um, yeah, maybe I won't do that. Let me talk about the life cap and the floor cap real quick when we talk about interest rates, because that's usually where people's minds, no matter what happens, everybody wants to kind of focus on that interest rate. So the fully indexed rate, remember, we've got a margin and an index. So this number, currently posted here, plus there's that margin, those two numbers added together, 4% plus 4.38, as of the 1st of September is 8.38. On a primary residence, different than if it was a rental, the floor rate is 3.75. So what that means is, is that for 30 years, if this went negative and indices have gone negative, okay, that's happened before, but if this went to a negative half, right, if this index said negative half, if you take a negative 0.5, and you add it to a positive 0.4, you'd be th at 3.5, right? It wouldn't matter if that were the case because your floor rate could never ever, the interest that is accrued could never be less on a primary residence than 3.75.
So if this went negative by a quarter, you're at your floor rate. If it went negative by more than a quarter, it won't matter because you will never pay less in interest than 3.75. That's the floor. The flip to that coin is the cap, the life cap. So also for 30 years, you will never pay more than what this life cap is. And the way that that's calculated is, is we're going to take the initial fully indexed rate. So depending on when you close the loan, if you close this in October, this number is going to say 8.08. .08. You take 6% plus 8.08. .08. If you were to close it today on the 26th of September, you take 6% of 8.38, .08, and there is your life cap of 14.38. So no matter what happens with this guy, you will never, ever, ever pay more than 14.38%. That is the life cap. Got it. I'll take, um, a, I'll take a pause. Yeah, I just thought of a question. Um, okay, so the question of how many of these do you do? Like, uh, you know, do you, is, are you just getting one all-in-one loan and getting all the benefit of all the incomes going towards the one? Or is there a world in which it makes sense to have a couple of these? Depends on the individual, I would say. Um, I'll exit out of this. How do I get back to us? There we that's, are. That's third so, tab. Did I do it right? Click on that no, uh, webinar tab, the, thir the third one that you have open. Up, up, the third up. one that I have open. Up. There it is. Web. Do you see the webinar one? No. Webcams. Oh, the the, the go-to, the PowerPoint orange box with the white in it. <laughs> okay. Go up at your, your tabs that you have open at the very top. There you go. Okay. Um, so who would it would it be advantageous for somebody to have more than one? Maybe. Okay. Depending on the individual's depository access and what they have left over. But if you think about it, more often than not, most people, it'll be counterintuitive for them to have more than one of these because if you have twenty thousand dollars a month and that's your number, depending on the other numbers, um, you have to split it up now. You've got two all in ones, right? So maybe 40% of that 20,000 you're gonna put here and 60% is gonna go here and then whatever the, the, the monthly residual is or leftover is will be split up differently, et cetera. So it may not be to your advantage to have more than one mm -hmm. um, or it may be. It really, it's it's gonna be an individual thing that that dictates whether you should have more than one of these or not. Mm -hmm. But if you're out there and you have, your, you have dual income in your household, you both get big old paychecks, you are building you know, large real estate portfolios, it might make sense to leverage this loan in multiple in multiple. Heck yeah. Properties. And you're eligible, just FYI, for qualifying purposes, you're eligible to have up to three all-in-one mortgages, one primary, one rental, one second home. But if you're married or you've got partnership or whatever, you could have, I guess, up to six. Right. Each of you could have have one of each if you had that kind of, of depository um, strength. Awesome. OK. It's amazing. Uh, honestly, it, it is mind blowing. And, and you didn't even touch too much on like your ability to recycle your ability to redeploy the same equity. I mean, that's what what became powerful for me when I looked at the calculator is it appeared that we had the ability to essentially recycle the same equity. I think it was five or six times. Yeah. Um, and constantly redeploy it. Let's do that. So we're going to keep using this as the, as our purchase example. Okay. Someone bought a home million bucks. They got their line limit is $800,000. Okay. So check this out, you guys. So if you look at the, I think it's this one. No, not that one. Here it is. So in the pay down table, it'll show you left side's the all in one. Here's our 30 year fixed. You'll be able to see that on month 14, you got 36,000, almost $37,000 that you could pull out and buy an investment property. Watch this. So let's go here. If you guys remember a second ago, I was, I was showing you this one. So we're going to say that we're going to put in, we're going to take $30,000 out in month 14, and we're going to buy an investment property with that money. Now, this is not 100% because this forecasts that I'm taking this 30,000 out in 14 months, but I want you to go back to the deposits and put in with that 30,000, let's say that you're gonna get a gross rents of 1200, okay, a month. This starts immediately, so it, it does actually work to the simulator's advantage, but it's, it's within a couple bucks, it's not gonna be huge. I would say that you definitely wanna put the income in as a result of taking that money out, even though it's futuristic, futuristically calculated on when it comes out, okay? So we've got $1,200 extra a month, and 20% of that 
is right 240 bucks so that property is cash flowing by 240 dollars you can change that by adjusting this here so let's see what happens when i do that so we've lost a little bit in the interest savings i think we've added a few months of of time to pay off but we have another property now that we didn't you know what i'm saying that you didn't have to go pull cash out of somewhere to get it this is, I mean, think about the, the tool that you guys have at your, your fingertips. I said this, I think, earlier in the, the, the webinar. You have become your own bank, guys. Think about how powerful that is. Yeah. Tack on a couple, tack on a couple months in the payment, but I got a property without right. really having to rely on any additional income. Right. Okay. Chaley, we've got some questions here. Let's, let's chip away at some of these. Um, the first, the first being, how do we get in touch with Chaley? We'll get we'll get Chaley's contact information up um, on the slide. But Chaley is a resource listed up on our resource page under lenders. You'll see her listed there. Um, her team is awesome. You can get in touch with them. Okay, does the all-in-one count as one of your ten Fannie Freddie loans? Good question. Let's talk about qualifications. Yes, this is a recourse loan, um, and it absolutely will count as one of the ten. The guidelines allow us per individual, if it's for a rental property purpose, you cannot have more than, this is rental and second home, you cannot have more than six finance properties and qualify for the all-in-one and put it on a rental property or a second home. If it's mm -hmm. your primary residence, I think you can have, a, have up to 20 finance properties without a problem. Ah, oh, goodness. What if you don't have a, what if you don't have a primary? Yeah, you cannot have more than six finance properties right now and qualify for the all-in-one. They updated those. And I think that as, as we start to lose the quantitative tightening, as we start to loosen and, and we think that those tides are turning, you guys have seen the headlines. Um, in the coming months, years, I think they're gonna re-loosen that. It hasn't always been the case. You could have up to 20 investment properties and get, if you could qualify in every other metric for the all-in-one, it was fine, but they really pulled that back um, during the pandemic. Interesting. All right. Um, okay, here's a good question. Can you combine several rental properties in one all-in-one HELOC to maximize the equity? I knew that one was coming and I should have just addressed it. Uh, the answer is technically no. This is not a cross-collateralization loan. However, manually, yes. So check this out. So it will not, the, the lien will not encumber multiple properties. It's only ever going to be one loan per property. But depending on that property, and if you have the value and enough equity in it, whether to start or even down the line, you can utilize it to accelerate the payoff of that other debt in a much more meaningful way. So that now, I'll give you an example. Let's say that you got a, a million dollars line of credit, okay? And you've got these three rental properties here. You could stroke a check, and, and each one of them has $100,000 outstanding, okay? You can pay off every one of those with this line of credit, on this one property, these are now free and clear, of course, mm -hmm. and you are housing the mortgage debt on those three into this one. So in oh, that sense, it's cross-collateralized. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. But they're unencumbered, right? You could go right. get more cash out if you wanted to. Right, wow. So take your illiquid your illiquid equity and bring it into a very liquid account that you can use. Yes, yes, and pay off much quicker. And, and run that simulator, you guys. So if you wanna do that, if somebody wants to play with that, See, if you have the equity in another property or at some point, maybe it takes you two years before you have enough, once you've paid it down, you could then, and, and you could do it in $20,000 chunks if you wanted to, right? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. So if you had a hundred grand in, in mortgage debt on this property, it may take you two, three years to pay it off, whatever, if, you, if that was your objective, because you're going to write checks out of the all-in-one, $20,000 a piece, and prepay that principal much faster, saving huge amounts of interest housing it here, you can do all that simulation on the, the interactive simulator. Okay, David wants to know, what are the risks of this loan? What's the downside, Chaley? I have not found one, and that's usually the first question I get is, well, okay, what's the, what's the fine print, right? What's yeah. the catch? Um, I don't know that there is, actually, here's, here's the catch. Uh, this is not a cheap loan. So um, this is the only thing I have been able to find about this loan product, uh, if there is a pro and a con. If you think about second lien HELOCs, if any of you has ever gotten a second lien, that's kind of free money. It might be a few thousand bucks, maybe. This loan cost-wise is every bit as expensive as any other traditional loan that you've ever received. All those third-party fees, the points, et cetera, this is not gonna be a cheap loan. However, that said, 
I would tell you that typically, if you're a good candidate for this, you're going to find that the interest savings will be made up in typically the first six to 12 months of having this via the cost. So if the costs were 10 grand or 20 grand or whatever, generally speaking, you'll be able to quantify that the interest savings that you're going to get from the loan will be matched or repaid in the first year, six to 12 months. Is the price of it any different if you're doing it on an acquisition versus a refinance of a property? No, no, no different. All right. Can um, is it is it uh, are you able to do, use this in every state? Uh, we are licensed. Ridge is licensed in 49 states. We cannot do these in New York. And the only other exception to that would be an owner occupied in Texas. We can do every other occupancy, every other state. So we cannot do it in New York, period, and we cannot do primary residence in the state of Texas. Texas has got some really weird um, laws about lines of credit that are so outdated. Somebody that lives in Texas, if you're hearing this, get to your legislation body and tell them what in the hell you guys need to overturn some of that weird stuff. I don't even know what, what the issue is. Anyway, <laughs> otherwise, yes. <laughs> Uh, that reminds me, someone asked the question when you had that map up there. They said, can we do a separate webinar to discuss conspiracy theories? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm there. I'll, I'll bring mine. I'll bring my popcorn and my conspiracy theories. Uh, I love it. Okay, Tom points out um, that this requires discipline. This loan requires discipline. Yes, Would you Tom. agree? Yes, absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, because, you know, there, I, I'm sure, and, and there's a lot of scrutiny, which is a sidebar to this, and I'll come back to it. Um, the underwrite and the qualifications to get this loan suck. Okay. I just want to prepare you guys. It's very, very hard to qualify for. Um, well, not very, very, it's more, it's more stringent to qualify for this than maybe just the Fannie Freddie loans. Okay. Um, but the reason for that is, is they want to make sure that the right people are utilizing it mm -hmm. and the numbers have to have to work because you're right. If you've got this line of credit for, you know, a million bucks and you only owe 250,000, those there are people that may say well what do you mean my account's overdrawn i still have checks left that kind of thing right mm -hmm. so um if you're going to use this to uh, satisfy a lifestyle and go on vacations and buy a new boat and right because you now have all this access uh, yeah that's that's going to be a problem probably for you not to say that you couldn't do those things with it but the the math has to make sense on the other end um, very good point, Tom. Yeah, you've got to be disciplined and and look at what your spending is and and know that you're a good fit for this in advance. And we do all that work up front. Mm -hmm. uh, Floria asks for clarification, and this kind of goes into what you're saying. She says, why are pre-retirees the ideal candidates for this? Probably because they have more you income. Still have income. Yeah, you still have income. There's plenty of retirees, especially those that have investment properties, and they've got that those access to those gross rents and that passive income that just kind of builds or post retirees that have chunks in their retirement account, depending on what you're earning, right? Cause you got to do that math. If you're earning 10%, if you are, I want to know what your investments are. If you're earning 10 plus percent, right? You're probably going to let that stay there. But if you have other investments that, you know, are modest in their earnings, maybe you want to take some of those and drop it in here and just save and have mm -hmm. access to that line of credit. The other thing too is that a post-retiree, unless they're going to be utilizing it for, I mean, if they're just going to utilize it to save interest, fine. If they have the means to do that, if they have the idle cash to do that, that's fine. But I would say that the post-retiree probably is going to like this better if they're still going to invest in real estate and have access to that line of credit because the other value adds of just having that access to invest is, is huge for them. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I just had a thought, too, because I was, I was speaking with someone the other day who was looking at a, you know, seven year time horizon of when they wanted to be, you know, retired and they wanted to try to create start investing to create a certain amount of cash flow, you know, within that seven year period to offset Social Security and, and other income. Um, I could see this loan program being a really great accelerant to a retirement plan that's on the near horizon because it gives you the ability to reduce a living, you're an expense. One of your biggest expenses in most cases would be your mortgage, right? You could play with that calculator and see like, okay, in an, in an eight year period, I can pay off this million dollar primary that I live in completely. And so now maybe I don't need $5,000 of cash flow, you know, to hit my goal because right. I've eliminated a mortgage in that same period of time. Absolutely. hundred percent. Okay. You're There's a couple. Yeah, there's a couple people who are like surprised that they hadn't heard of this. Like, is it new? Like, 
And, and someone asked, um, like, why isn't everybody doing this? What, what, what's your answer to that? You know, because they don't know about it. It's not mainstream. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I started to talk about, and I think there's some, some valid, um, and not even conspiracy theory. So the, the, the government sponsored enterprises, GSEs, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you guys, those are, those are the loans that were sort of preconditioned to understand in, in this, this country. Um, and to remove those and the interest that is paid on those and the secondary markets and the mortgage-backed securities, I mean, there, it, it's, it's a full circle when you think about even your own um, retirement accounts, 401ks, for example. You guys know that your 401k is utilizing or housing mortgage-backed securities in it. Did you guys know that? So what you're paying yourself back in retirement actually has to do with some of it anyway, is going to be based on the, on those bonds. Um, so it, it probably is, is entirely about that. Um, and it's, it's more complicated. So it's not the kind of thing that people can just hear and understand, right? Most people hear this and they think, oh, that's a sham. That's a scam. Or there's some, you know, there's some nefarious underbelly of, of something. So they just dismiss it automatically. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I would, I would draw to that to say that's probably why. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime, anytime I think someone starts think, hearing strategies that require you to link your checking account right. and then put everything on a credit card and like, but they, they stopped listening there and didn't sure. hear <laughs> about the, yeah, they shut, they shut down. Yeah. Kaylee, I know you're a busy lady and we're over the hour. Do you have an extra five or so yeah. minutes? Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm totally good. Yep. Okay. Um, is there a 30 year draw on this? Yes, it is a 30 year. So let, let me go back to that part. This is it, and I love this feature. It's a 30 year line of credit, you guys. You will have access to this line of credit for 30 years if you were to keep it. And I know one of the follow-up questions to this is gonna be, well, what if my home appreciates? Can I have more of a line limit? The only way you can extend or increase that limit is to do a full refinance, okay? So whatever your, re your limit starts with, that's what you're gonna be stuck with unless you refi and, and increase it. But you have access for 30 years. What happens is, remember, your balance, okay? The balance on the line of credit and the limit the balance can never be higher than the limit. What you owe, what's outstanding, can never be higher than what that limit is. So knowing that, how the repayment works is, is that in the first month of year 11, the limit will start to reduce by a factor of one 240th percent. Okay, 240th is the equivalent of months in the trailing 20 years. First 10 years, unchanged. The final 20 years, or 240 months, means that the limit will start to go down by one 240th percent. Your balance can never exceed your limit. Here's the round math example that I give. Let's say you start with a limit of $100,000, okay? In the first month of year 11, the limit's gonna go down by one 240th, so now your limit is 99,760. That round math, 240 bucks off of 100 grand, 99,760. So because the limit will start to go down extremely gradually and what you owe can never exceed that, that's how that repayment would work, but you still have full access to it based on mm -hmm. those terms. What happens when all the principal is paid off? Do you lose the ability or does it, it can no. sit there suspended for the full 30 years? 30 years. Yeah. If it's, I mean, yeah, you just have a free and clear line of credit. Now that limit will continue to, to drop a little bit month after month, but you still have full access. Okay. Matt's question is if after it's paid off, do excess deposits then generate interest income? Um, I'm going to have to check. So the two, just FYI, Matt, you could probably find this online, Merchants Bank or North Point Bank, those are the two FDIC insured uh, depository uh, entities that will house this loan. It'll be one of the two when we sell this off our line. Um, so I'm going to say maybe, I don't know, actually, I don't know if, if yep. deposits, they may have something, but it'll be akin to what you would get on a, a just a, a traditional one percent or whatever whatever would be yeah so if there is it's going to be nominal yep okay a couple questions guys we are recording this so if you join late or you need to hear this a second time which you probably do it took me three or four times to get it and me frankly too. it took me playing with a simulator before the light bulbs really came on um so we'll get this replay edited up on uh Chaley's page on our resource uh drop down menu by tomorrow Okay. Are these accounts FDIC insured or otherwise protected? Yep. Exactly as any, any other FDIC insured account, 
Um, the follow-up question to that a lot of times people will ask, since I'll just throw it out there, is, is the interest deductible in the same way as it would be on a 30-year fixed mortgage? 100%. So the IRS rule is about deductibility of interest if it was used for home improvement or investment purposes, absolutely deductible. If you did a cash out refinance and went on a, a two month trip to Europe, you're not supposed to deduct that. And that would be the same rules with, with the all-in-one. All in if it's used for home improvement and investment purposes, same in interest deduction on this as you would on a 30 year fixed. Okay. Stephanie wants to know, are you able to take this out in an LLC, in an entity? Good question. So Stephanie, the loan is gonna close in your individual name and title will also close in your individual name. Should you decide to execute a quit claim deed and put it into your LLC, you can do that as long as you are the majority owner of the entity. Okay. Let's see here. Some of these have already done. The difference between the primary and second home line of credit. What was the loan to value difference between the two? Um, on a purchase, there this uh I'll just actually I don't know if that's the same. So on a purchase, owner occupied can go to 90. I think a second home can go to 90 as well. On a cash out refinance, I think it's the same. I think owner occupied and, and second home are the same, 80% on a cash out refinance. It's the non-owner occupied when we're talking about leverage that changes to 70 and 75% depending on if it's cash out or rate and term or purchase. Okay. Um, all right. This person says, what about building a primary home? Three million is the appraised value, one million loan amount, any special requirements, and how does the draw work? Uh, if it's for new construction where you, you need a construction loan, this won't apply. But if you're replacing a construction loan with the all-in-one all day long, 90% um, uh, of the ARV should be acceptable. And the draw will be, you know, you'll pay off whatever the existing balance is with this, and that's where you'll start. All right. Uh, oh, here's a good question. And I thought of this too. The commingling of business income and expenses with personal, doesn't this go against the cardinal rule of keeping things separate? Uh, you know, I don't, uh, that's not an IRS rule that I'm aware of. Okay, somebody feel free to challenge me on this, but um, I think that that the unless it's a, a S corp or a C corp, I don't think that there is any commingling. If we're talking about just the rental properties, if they're in an LLC, chances are you're not even filing a, a, a business tax return for those. And if you are, I've got thoughts on it that we should talk about because you're doing yourself a disservice, and that's the whole other thing for underwriting purposes. Um, but no, the commingling thing, I think it's more the CPA um, wanting you to be more organized, so it's easier for them to do their work. Uh, otherwise, unless it's a trust account that we're talking about, or like I said, an S corp or a C corp, um, the commingling is is not an IRS rule that I am aware of. And the okay. banking features within um, they, you know, the online banking features, etc. Uh, I believe you can sort by by different activity anyway. So there is a, I mean, I guess you know that might be something that someone could draw to to say is mm -hmm. a, a a deficiency of this um, mm -hmm. that you are taking everything and it's now going in here and the accounting mm -hmm. is going to be in this one account. Yeah. I would talk with your attorney too, about if you're yeah. worried about like piercing the veil, right. And, and having, if you have, if you own the rental property and entity and they've advised you to keep the banking very clean to just keep it separate from you. I mean, talk to them about their thoughts on this and um, if this is something you shouldn't do, or if it does change <laughs> any liability to you. Okay. Let me see if there's any other here that are are good. The more the more we ask, the more come in. <laughs> uh, okay, here's a good one. Are there any minimums or maximums on the loan amounts? Minimum uh, draw is a hundred thousand. Um, I think the maximum is three million. I think. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, an exit strategy. What what happens when you sell the primary home while you're utilizing this loan? It just same as say it's no change to that versus a 30-year fixed. It just pays off if there's a balance. 
it'll be repaid upon the sale and whatever proceeds are left over, you would get in the same way. So no difference between this and, and a traditional mortgage being paid off on a sale. Awesome. No All prepayment right, penalty. No prepayment penalty? No prepayment penalty ever. No, nope, not on the all in one. So nothing like that to worry about. Excellent. Listen, we put the link to the simulator in the chat. Um, so if you haven't already, our hope was that you wouldn't pull up the simulator and be doing that while we were <laughs> while we were talking. So you'd listen. But Smart. Uh, we've got the link in the chat there. And then Chaley, you've got your contact information up here. What should people know about like reaching out to you if they're interested in in doing one of these? You know, I would say, guys, I would really like to play with the simulator. OK, email us at info there as you see if you want more information. We've got an FAQ sheet that we can send you real quickly. There's a highlight um, uh, page for all the qualifications for the all in one. But for those of you that are really interested and you just want to make sure you've got another set of eyeballs on it, I'd love to do the simulator with you. We'll get on a Teams call. We'll, we'll share a screen. We'll go over, you know, uh, and then I can help make sure that the input is accurate because, right, bad input invalid results and then i can help you interpret those results too so for anybody that really wants to dig into this let's do the simulator together yes awesome well chaley thank you so much for taking some time to educate on this uh really a powerful tool and again for those of you who've been looking at all the equity that you've got in a property um i think this is absolutely a loan product that you should be considering um see if it if it works for you my very favorite chaley, thank you we'll have you back again soon okay okay thanks leah see you guys Bye.